just Gary Barber. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Roseanne, and I'm Real Progressive's National Outreach Director. And first of all, I want to extend just the warmest welcome to each and every one of you from everybody, all of us in the Real Progressives family. You know, all of us have our own uh, personal reasons for being part of Real Progressives. And we're also a, a very distinct group. But you know, the one thing that we have in common is that we care profoundly so much I can't even tell you about humanity and the planet that we share. We're at an exciting time for Real Progressives and I'm so proud to be a part of that excitement. And now I would like to uh, introduce you to the man who introduced me to Real Progressives and he showed me that world that I always dreamed of and I worked toward and that world is absolutely possible. And now the founder of Real Progressives, Steve Grumbine. Hey, thanks Rose, I, I appreciate that immensely. And welcome everybody. Um, that was Rose and uh, Rose is, just so you all know, she is our national outreach director, as she said, and that means that she's going out there trying to help volunteers get engaged uh, trying to get other organizations to work with us, um, hoping that people, rather than trying to run off and be soloist, find a home at Real Progressives and help us build something. Um, as you all know, the powers that we're up against are outrageously well-funded. We are not. They are outrageously well-organized. We want to be, but we are not. And unfortunately, we're all doing the best we can in between, uh, you know, kid diapers and getting to work and doing things that regular people have to do in a normal life while simultaneously trying to run two nonprofits and try to change the world. So it's a challenge, but it's a challenge we're willing to try to take up with your help. Um, so anyway, one of the things um, that I wanted to make sure that you all knew you know, Real Progressives has been around since back in the first Bernie Sanders primaries. Um, it originally started as a bit of a joke. Um, the idea was there was a bunch of people running around calling themselves real Democrats. And we felt like, you know, we didn't really care whether we were a D or an R or whatever. We were largely independents and we thought more progressively. And so we said, well, you know what? We're real progressives, and we support Stephanie Kelton, who is Bernie's chief economic advisor and uh, who is advancing modern monetary theory. And so that was the genesis of our launch. We were supporting Bernie Sanders, and um, it was a lot of fun. But then when the uh, primary ended and uh, Hillary was coronated, uh, a lot of people broke off into their own directions. Many of you all were around for that. Some of you maybe didn't know all the details, uh, but going back to the DNC where we were boots on the ground right outside of the uh, Philadelphia, um, you know, where all the action was, uh, you know, a lot of us were sitting there scratching our heads saying, now what? Now what do we do now that this big thing is over? And some people fell away. Some people went off and did their own thing. But we, real progressives, stayed the course. We brought some varying people through the doors, people that had different ideas. They didn't always mesh up. People came, people went. And that's just the nature of a volunteer organization. So persistence, long suffering, <laughs> uh, a willingness to keep fighting. And Real Progressives still lives, and now we are actually two organizations. We are Real Progressives Incorporated, and we are Real Progress in Action, Inc. Uh, Real Progress, Inc. is the latest thing that we've started, which is a 
501c4, and the 501c3 is Real Progressives. That 501c3 will be all about educating people about not just how to pay for uh, all the programs, but actually working with academic groups and other uh, community organizations to pull together grants and initiatives uh, to pull existing policy from some of the experts within the modern monetary theory field and be able to leverage that knowledge into um, advancing policy for the common man. Uh, we're not trying to compete with academics. That's not our role in this mix. Um, we are, in essence, the voters. We are Joe Q public, and we want to make sure that every one of us is equipped to fight back. There is nothing worse, nothing worse than uninformed populism that leads large groups of people in the wrong direction. And so Real Progressives prides itself on being true north of the progressive movement. And that is all fueled with the undergirding of the knowledge that comes with modern monetary theory. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. So I was hoping um, that uh, maybe uh, one of the others would read this, but I'll go ahead and read this for you. Um, you know, ultimately, um, I didn't found Real Progressives in 2009. I found modern monetary theory in 2009. Um, but I was a lifelong conservative. I actually, uh, you know, was a huge Reaganite. I voted for W. Uh, I voted for his daddy. I, in fact, uh, when um, Bush Sr. Uh, was actually running the first time, it was my very first election, I was allowed to vote. So I grew up a Republican. I went through my life, you know, adult life, most of my early adult life as a Republican. And it was only when I was exposed to modern monetary theory and the global financial crisis that I began to realize something wasn't quite right. And um, anyway, I was unemployed for 18 months. And um, there's been pieces of this uh, unemployment that keep recurring. Why is that? Because our economy is largely a gig economy. And instead of being able to find permanent work, I'm typically in my field um, and the wage band that I need to survive to be able to pay for my child support and stuff. I, I'm unfortunately stuck being a contractor and contractors come and go with the breeze of the wind. So very, very difficult economic times for some of us. And, and, and it's within that framework that I came to understand it, that if this was that bad for me, a, you know, a guy who had master's degrees and tons of certifications, a metric ton of uh, experience from Verizon and Ma Bell and you name it. Um, ultimately, I realized that it, it had to be triple bad, maybe even a hundred times worse for uh, minority communities who were uh, vulnerable to people who didn't have education and didn't have a family that supported them. Um, so anyway, ultimately, I, I ran into people like a gentleman named Bruce Patrick who took me under his wing, spent long nights teaching me about taxes, not funding spending, and teaching me about new economic perspectives and the who's who of the MMT world. And he introduced me to Warren Mosler, who you'll get to hear from shortly, um, and introduced me to an entirely new way of thinking that I still wonder if he did me any favors by opening my mind to this. Um, it has been literally consuming me 24 by 7 uh, for almost a decade now. If, if you can imagine thinking about this day in and day out. Now, mind you, Warren can tell you he's been doing it a lot longer than that. <laughs> but for me, as just a regular guy, especially a right-wing guy who made the full trip around the sun over to progressive land, as a result of understanding how economics works and getting rid of all the horse crap that I had thought of as a conservative, you know, oh, you know, it's my hard-earned tax dollars, and I don't want to pay for people's bad decisions and all this stuff. Ultimately, it came to be that this organization became a, a vehicle for me to both exercise my education and exercise the demons, if you will, the exorcise, not exercise, but exorcise 
those demons that had plagued me for so long by giving me a vehicle and a voice to be able to speak out on these issues. Um, Real Progressives started out as a group. It was a closed group. We had intended just to use it to organize. And then we realized, oops, we can't share out of our group. So we tried to figure out how we could do it. And then we said, ah, let's create a Facebook page. And so that's how the page Real Progressives came to be because we couldn't share from our group. And uh, in very, very short order, we went from 500 to 5,000 to 25,000 to 50,000 to 90,000 to 100,000 and up to 125 before uh, Facebook decided to really, really screw us with the algorithms. Um, we were hitting close to 30 million people a month. I want you to think about that as an alternative media entity. We were reaching 30 million people a month at our peak. Now we're somewhere around 2 million, which, you know, hey, I'll take it, but it's nowhere near 30, obviously. So that means we've got to do things a little differently now. We've got to work around the algorithms. We're dependent on you sharing our work, not ignoring it, clicking like and sharing the heck out of it, because otherwise Facebook literally closes the door on us. Same thing with YouTube. If we don't get likes and clicks in the very beginning, the stuff drops to the bottom and no one ever sees it. And the same thing goes with our podcast, which is our pride and joy, which is macro and cheese, uh, which comes out every Saturday morning at 8 a.m. Um, a new episode uh, with experts and great stories. One, I mean, I'm really proud of this. I've done well over 500 interviews in my life and every one of these macro and cheese interviews is worth its weight in gold. I, I promise you it's, it's worth the investment. Anyway, if you'll skip to the next one. So, you know, we, we built this thing based on four pillars because I couldn't bring myself to just do media. Media by itself just left us barking at current events. And, and as you all know, current events are what distracts us from fighting for a Green New Deal. Current events are what distracts us from actually making progress in terms of getting rid of student debt or in terms of understanding the money story. In terms of talking about anything meaningful, current events constantly get in the way. And how many of these current events are even real current events? Many of them are spun up yarns told by the mainstream press, gaslighting us to death. And this is another reason why we came into existence because media has no integrity. And we wanted to be an organization that provided the truth no matter what, no matter how ugly and no matter where it led. So we built this organization based on four pillars. There's four pillars are policy, which I talked a little bit about. We're going to be a poor man's think tank, leveraging the academics work and working with other like-minded organizations to bring about coalitions to advance modern monetary theory and the progressive agenda wherever we can get a foothold. The next one is education. And we do a lot of this stuff in live streams. We do a lot of this stuff in uh, these events that we do and our social media engagements and so forth. But we're looking at literally creating short form viral type videos, um, leveraging some of the work that Bill Mitchell's doing at MMT University, leveraging other things throughout everywhere we go, anything from deficit owls to the modern money network, whatever, Levy, you know, UMKC, New Economic Perspectives, it doesn't matter. We are promiscuous. We will use any and all resources, especially the center of the universe, Warren Mosler, and Seven Deadly Innocent Frauds, which is the ground zero, do not pass go, do not collect 200 book you must read to get into the game to really understand what the heck's going on around here. Um, and then the third pillar is activism. So, what good does it do to have all this knowledge, sit there in the ivory tower and just talk poetically amongst other academics and it goes nowhere? It goes nowhere, literally. I, Warren can tell you more about this, but when I first got involved in this, there were no memes. There was no one shouting taxes don't fund spending. There was nobody doing videos constantly except for maybe Mike Norman. And the other videos were always grainy and just bad Audio, and a lot of that hasn't changed, unfortunately, but we're going to get there. Um, ultimately, um, you know, there was very few people that really knew this stuff. 
And, uh, you know, if you listen to Matt Forstater, who we had on Macro and Cheese, uh, he tells the story of MMT and he tells the history of how he got to meet Warren and how Warren would call him on the phone and say, so how many people know about MMT today? And Matt would be like, uh, five, I think, <laughs> six. And uh, so literally he, he was at ground zero with this. And uh, now it's counted in the, probably in the millions, honestly, you, you know, I, I, in the hundreds of thousands for sure. And, you know, it, it, it's very interesting to watch, but the activism piece of what we're doing has got to transcend just the normal Republican Democrat narrative, because we're redefining what economics is. We're actually telling you the way it is, the, the way it really works versus the myths and legends that we've been told, both in grad school, where I learned it in the MBA program, and the doctoral programs, so you name it, and every TV program, every Little House on the Prairie episode, to you know, every Law and Order, all of them are filled with neoliberal garbage that tells you the wrong stuff. I mean, there was a Roseanne uh, episode where Roseanne chastised her sister for uh, socialism and Medicare for all, and that just is socialism, and they're just going to run out of other people's money. And the minute I heard that, I said, God bless it. Even the comedians, even the talk shows, even everything is neoliberal garbage. And you begin to see it under every rock, under every pillow and every cranny and nook, you name it. And so the activism is our way of approaching this and really attacking it. We have a motto called each one teach one. Because if we don't each one teach one, each one won't reach one. And we need to reach one and we need to reach two and three and five and more. And you're going to hear a little bit more about that as we go on. But we have to generate snowflakes, little blast radiuses, each one of us, as we go out and we speak this truth to power. As we tell people that we can have nice things, as we tell people and blow the lid off the fact that we can, in fact, save ourselves from cataclysmic climate change that we can have health care, that we can have nice things, and that the government isn't broke. In fact, it's the one thing the government absolutely isn't. It may be corrupt, it may be captured, it may be a lot of things, but it is absolutely 100% not broke. And it truly can serve the public purpose and the people's needs. And then the final piece, the glitzy, glammy, the exciting one, the one everybody loves, the media pillar. This is where we can do our shows. This is where we can do educational programming. This is where we can do, you know, everything from documentaries. And, and let me tell you, before Warren comes up, I want to say, years ago, I approached Warren and I said, I want to do Cosmos for Economics. I want to do a documentary series where we talk about economics from the beginning on through, just like Neil Tyson Degrassi, and Carl Sagan, et cetera. I want, I want to have cosmos for economics and i want to see warren mosler walking in front of a big giant globe spinning as money is printing behind him and <laughs> coins are falling all over the place and i want to hear warren telling you the money story and i want to publicize this i want to take it big I mean, these are things that we keep thinking about they're real big ideas but we need volunteers we need workers we need technology we need money we need funds man to do these things and, you know, we've got a very small group of people right now that are carrying the entire load. And, um, and it's quite challenging. I'm not going to lie. We've got a lot of people that, quote, unquote, are real progressives. But we only have a pocket full that actually raise their hand and say, how can I help? How can I be a part of this? How can I make this successful? And that's what we're hoping we can get with you all. That's what we're hoping for as we built these two organizations, the 501c3, I mean, this allows us to go after grants. It allows us to work with academic institutions. It allows us to give donations that are tax deductible. You guys can write those donations off in the 501c3. And in the 501c4, no, you can't write those off. But we can literally start endorsing and fighting for not only candidates, but causes. And we can really, really begin to elevate candidates that are not cowardly and not 
wimpy and that are willing to raise the bar and talk about the money story and help us advance these very important life-changing programs. So in a nutshell, we're four pillars, we're seven knowledge areas, we're one umbrella in two organizations with a fantastic podcast engineered by Andy uh, Kennedy, uh, graphics, which are the uh, 300 slash Sin City style uh, yellow and uh, black and sepia, which is Mindy Donham, and all the fancy write-ups that you get with it come from Virginia Cots. And then I do the interviews with all the great experts out there that we get to have the opportunity to talk to. Anyway, go ahead to the next. Uh, oh, no, no, I want to talk about these. If you all are looking at the uh, presentation that is on the screen right now, I want to talk to you about what these icons are because this is the bread and butter of real progressives. We have seven knowledge areas, as I said, and you see the little owl in the middle. This is economic justice. Second one is environmental and ecological justice. The third one, see the peace sign? That's peace with justice. The fifth one down there uh, is actually democracy. Then we jump to uh, equality with justice. And then the next one is health and well-being. And the last one, because I know you all have heard all this nonsense about the robots coming and automation, taking all the jobs. Last one is technology and innovation. And where we'll be able to talk about the ethical use of technology and the actual impacts of technology uh, on the economy and on the people's lives and how we can make it benefit not only the rich, but all of society. So we all get the benefit of that automation. All right, can you go ahead and go to the next? Okay, so I sort of touched on this a few minutes ago, and this is an important piece right here. You know, our enemy is organized and well-funded. Now, if you look at a lot of the other organizations out there, they're chasing every ambulance that runs by. Every time there's an opportunity to put their fist in the air, they're out there at some event. There is no cohesive demand. There's no cohesive campaign. There's very little cohesive strategy. It's just impulsive. It's in the moment. And they do it. It leads off energy. And then everybody goes back to their lives. Our goal here is to provide purpose-driven media that has a programmatic approach, not only to the issues that we address, but to the demands we make and have that flow end to end through every process in the organization. We'll have sustained campaigns in our activism. In other words, it's not like we go out there with pussy hats one day and ask for Donald Trump's tax returns. What we do is we make the point of what is it that we want? We want a Green New Deal. And so the goal will be to do everything we can in support of that goal. That'll be the end goal and everything else, all seven of those knowledge areas will drive toward that goal. And we will do events, we will do activism, we will do direct action, we will do whatever it takes media-wise to bring that to fruition for whatever strength in numbers we are able to acquire. And as I already said, everything we do is always premised off of understanding that we can do nice things through the lens of modern monetary theory. Okay, the next one. Yeah, anyway, go ahead, next slide. So one of the things that we do here at Real Progressives is we have a PMO and we do what is called Agile or Scrum. And Agile and Scrum allows a, democ a democratic way of getting projects done. Instead of everything being top-down, there is some hierarchy. There is definitely some top-down. But there is a lot more in terms of the democratic control of these projects once they're started. We have certain goals. We have certain needs. We have certain things based on our seven knowledge areas and our four pillars. And then we kick off projects. And the team works in small, agile project teams. And they do projects in short bursts with small deliverables. And, and this is a way that people that don't have a whole lot of time available but really want to participate 
can be a part of these projects, contribute in whatever fashion they're able to contribute to, and know that at the end of the day, it will make a difference. And that to me is a really, really important uh, factor in being a part of Real Progressives. We're giving you a skill, a programmatic approach, and we're giving you things that will actually translate to the real world. It's not just a Facebook thing anymore, folks. This is not your mama's Facebook page. We're now growing into a real bona fide legal entity and organization, actually two of them. Okay, go ahead, next one. So, you know, one of the funny things is, I don't know if you all can tell, but right here are these two ketchup bottles, okay? You know, we, we think of the mainstream and we realize that the stuff doesn't work very well. And all you gotta do is remember an old school glass ketchup bottle. And you try and get the ketchup out and you're banging, you're banging, you're banging, and finally you hit it the right way and it squirts everywhere. And it's just all over the place. We like to believe, if you look at the other squirt bottle here, the one that's upside down, that we've designed a better way of doing this, that we can do it in a targeted fashion, and that by taking a programmatic approach and getting everybody on the team to act as a leader in and of themselves, as a part of the whole, not pulling in their own direction, not doing their own little thing, but actually contributing to an organization that hopefully is delivering on a purpose that they, you, we, share in. And to me, that's the difference between the others and us. That's what we're trying to do. I would rather be slow and methodical and do the right thing than just go off half cock doing this and that and the other and end up with garbage. It's very important to me that the things we do have impact, that they last, and that they matter. Okay, next. Keep going, just tap through. So as you can see here, you know, the idea here is passion with a purpose backed by a solid media platform enacting meaningful change. And you see, you got activism. I mean, let's be fair, the pussy hats went out in massive numbers. Goodness, if we only had that many people that understood MMT, what could we have done? And then the next one's Occupy Wall Street. Well, you know, guess what? In policy, what happens if we could have informed all of Occupy about modern monetary theory? What would have happened if all those people that were taken to the streets instead of just putting their fist in the air and not knowing what they were saying, what if they would have had MMT informed demands? What would have happened if everybody knew instead of being gaslit? Think about it for a minute. I mean, that's huge. And then the best thing, we have ties to people like Warren and other academics who invest an incredible amount of time in helping us get content out to you all. And it's really important that you guys take them up on it and listen to it and learn it. But this provides us with that necessary credibility. And then the last piece here, of course, is outreach working with colleges, working with local communities, working with political parties, working with other organizations like-minded, and even working with organizations that maybe aren't like-minded, but who are willing to take a listen. That's what Real Progressives is all about. So I hope that you all see this, you feel like it's a place that you can be, and you see this, that education shapes policy and activism drives law. Think about that for a minute. Who gives a crap if we just waste a bunch of energy, put up a bunch of cardboard signs, get the t-shirt, take selfies and do the peace sign at everybody, and then we go home and nothing changed. I'm not in this for moral victories, guys and gals. I want to win because the price of defeat is too much for me to pay. Too, too great. The cost is too great. So to me, this is where we really provide the impact. And that is only going to be if we all do it, not me, us, you, your friends, your next friends, people you've never met, the colleges you went to, the student unions you go to, the other groups that are out there talking with Sunrise Movement, talking with Code Pink, talking with the Green Party, talking with the Justice Democrats, talking with everyone, our revolution talking even to the Tea Party, 
if need be, to whoever will listen, to give them the necessary tools to understand that we can, in fact, unite and fight for our own survival and win as a country, as a world, and, and, and really do great things. Next. So when you look at this, this is kind of a neat little schematic. It's going to fill up. The idea here is, is that we're looking at building a tiered approach. This, we're, we're not just going to do this in the U.S. We're going to do this around the world. But right now, we're looking for volunteers. And we're looking for community leaders that can fit into their local communities and help build at the local level, at the grassroots. And then we're going to be looking for state coordinators to be able to help tie this all together. And then, of course, throughout our regions, we're going to look for commonalities, common things, because we're going to do three-day activist boot camps, things like that, where we can go out there, have other organizations come, bring experts in, and talk to them directly, not in some sort of lofty language, but in a language that is useful and that can actually produce an army of people who are ready to take back their democracy and take back the power of money from the lore that we've been led to believe. And then obviously the national, which is our headquarters, which is where the core of a lot of this is gonna take place. Because again, the fight we have is on a global scale. It is not a US only thing. And in fact, the quicker we realize that our uh, survival is dependent on joining with others around the world, who are going through the same problems and finding ways to work collaboratively to build networks that are completely redundant and able to uh, take down these established, um, well-funded groups. That's, that's what we have to do. And it isn't going to happen with a couple people that don't like each other running off and starting a new Facebook group. I wish that was the case. I wish that was all it took. But it doesn't. We're building an organization. We're, this is the end of just plain old social media. And this is, hey, I'm serious, guys. I really want to win now. That's, that's what we're talking about here. And I hope that each one of you see that. And as you think about the silly social media wars, and you start realizing that this fight is much bigger than that, push that crap away and start focusing on the real story, the real war, and building something truly momentous to take on something as bad as the Pete Peterson Foundation. Is that way, way too big for us right now? <laughs> Absolutely. But you gotta have a dream, and I don't dream small. So this, to me, is very important that you all understand this. This is how we win. All right, next slide. Okay. So I already kind of touched on this and I uh, want to just quickly go through this. We're looking for skills and talents. We're not just looking for, you know, people to cheer us on. We like cheerleaders. We need cheerleaders, but we need people to roll up their sleeves and do some of these things. And we've got some graphic designers, but we need more. And we need people that want to learn it. We need video and audio editors because we only have one podcast, but we'd like to have a podcast for every one of our knowledge areas. We'd like to have a general news podcast. We'd like to have a bunch of things. And we also need people that are project management trained or willing to learn and folks that understand process development, which is Six Sigma. We're looking for volunteer coordinators and all that takes is a desire to talk to people and to keep them engaged and not let them drift away and start playing in social media land again, but keep them in the fold so that we can continue to build instead of allow petty nonsense to destroy an organization trying to be built. We're also looking for editors, people that can write, people that can edit, etc. Journalists, people who really are willing to take this fight and put it into writing. And not every so often, but meaningfully write consistently so we can have a publication that is a place where people say, I need to read Real Progressives today. Let me go check Real Progressives today. We're looking for citizen journalists who can attend newsworthy events and actually do the live streaming for us. 
it does it, it always fascinates me that people are willing to live stream on their own wall in front of three people when we've got 120 some thousand people here and if we just had our team working together we could really make that event worthwhile we could really really give it some coverage this goes for our friends that are around the world these i mean i see some of these events where they got 10 people watching where if we could have live streamed it we could have given them hundreds of people watching thousands eventually on our YouTube channel, on Facebook, you name it. So we need social media wars. For those of you who all who like engaging in social media, we have opportunities here. We have real opportunities here to share, to comment, to provide a real um, engagement that drives our reach, drives our viewership, drives our listening audience, drives our reading audience, drives participation because that is how Facebook gauges its algorithms. That is how YouTube gauges its algorithms. That is how Twitter gauges its algorithms. And if people look at it and they don't smash the like button, if they don't comment, guess what happens to that good content? It drops to the floor and goes away and vanishes, never to be seen again, because that is what the algorithms do when people don't share, when people don't comment, when people don't like. And so it's really important that we have a team of people that understand that and helps us overcome those, those systems that are meant to keep us from breaking out. We're also looking for folks that can help us manage the two websites and actually sort of three websites. Four, if you want to count, we got Patreon. We got two Patreons. We've got two websites. We've got a 501c3 website and a 501c4 website. For real progress in action and real progressives. We also have the Macro and Cheese podcast site. So we, we have a lot of needs for these things. And we're looking for people who actually understand not just social media marketing, but monetizing podcasts, monetizing different things, providing revenue streams for nonprofits that are willing to help us write grants, are willing to help us do a number of things with working with other groups, you know, it, it does no good if you're, you're championing yourself. We need somebody that can help champion the organization to these other organizations so that we can build our reps, so that we can begin actually doing the things that we're trying to build this place to do. All right, next slide. All right, so that's the end of my talk. Before I bring Warren on, does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask me? Because then I want to bring Warren right in. Carrie, are there any questions out there at all? Um, I, I'm actually watching your team um, get volunteers engaged. We've got Rose talking to folks about um, different opportunities. Virginia is getting people engaged with um, live streaming events. So what's going on in chat is all of the team is pairing up with potential volunteers. Okay. All right. Well, then what I'll do, rather than try and take up time doing that, let me introduce Warren Mosler. And, and folks, I want you to understand something. Warren is probably the nicest man I've ever met in my life. I've, I've known Warren not quite for 10 years. I think I first got introduced to Warren back around 2009, 2010. And um, he's always been very kind to me. And full disclosure, I used to run a group called Grumbine's Political Mosh Pit. And, you know, I was a right winger at the time, you know, and I uh, was championing Ron Paul and, uh, these guys came in and um, we had a really, really good, engaged discussion group. Lots and lots of people that were actually engaging and we purposely kept the numbers below 3,000. We never let it go above like 2,800 because we wanted to make sure that the people there were contributing value. Now, there were some people that drove you nuts, but for the most part, we tried to really add value and Warren was in this group. And so were a lot of the other people that you know and love. Mike uh, Norman, uh, you had Joe Firestone, uh, Bruce Patrick, um, you had some of the other folks from various groups like Charles Hayden, um, Rob Steinernomics, <laughs> uh, Rob Steiner. Anyway, um, we had a bunch of folks in there, really, really good people that had come through the door. 
And um, I got to watch Warren in action. And every time I would share something, if Warren gave me a like, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I floated for days. I was like, Warren Mosler, like my comment. Warren Mosler, like my comment. And I mean, I'd pick up the phone, Bruce, Bruce, guess what? Warren gave me a like. He's like, no, nah. oh man, that's great. And it, it was a really big deal. It still is, by the way. And so, you know, whenever I hear Warren speak, whenever I, I see him, Warren has done more for me, and I won't get into the details, but let me just suffice it to say that Warren, I owe so much of the good things in my life. The few that I have, I can attribute to the hope that he's given me. And um, because this is our first national outreach call, I wanted to make sure that the guy that I asked to be our first speaker uh, you know, we had Fadl talk at our all hands call, but this is the first time we opened up to the public. And I felt like, you know what? It's important to have the father of modern monetary theory or as it used to be called Mosler economics. And so without further ado, I'd like to bring on my friend, Warren Mosler. Warren, thank you for coming here and thank you for everything you've ever done. Oh, well, good to be here. And uh, my hat size just went up about two inches. <laughs> uh, so I just turned 70 this year and I can't stay up this late Steve you're killing me <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that man. I'm 50 and I feel the same <laughs> yeah so uh okay so what would you like me to start with here what do we do next well I would like you just to give the money story let folks okay. know who you are and how the money story came to be and and just let them, you know, give them a few minutes of, of the story and then let them ask questions. You know, if people have questions about MMT, give them an opportunity to ask and then we'll go through that and, and then we'll let you get to sleep. <laughs> okay. And, and I'll just go through it quickly and give you what I think is uh, the, the importance of it now because uh, it's getting fragmented and it's getting fragmented by MMT proponents. And M MMT is still obviously doing well and moving up, but uh, you know it's we, we need all the help we can get, and, and to not fragment this message, I think would be very constructive right now. So, um, if, and if you ask anybody what MMT is now, or any article that says, "Well, what is MMT?" they'll say, "Well, it's about the central bank monetizing the debt to fund the treasury, or some nonsense like that." Okay, and I don't. Know. You know, I guess I sort of know where this stuff's come from, where they'll take somebody who they'll set up as a proponent of MMT and then you know, quote them as their answer to when they, they're asked a question. And uh, one thing leads to another. And, and, and so, you know, we've been all fighting this for a while here. So, look, the, the MMT money story, uh, when it started, was unique because uh, – all the other schools of thought in economics had money starting with some kind of barter situation or some kind of exchange that developed out of necessity or needs or to streamline commerce or something like that. And, and you know, I'm not saying none of that happened. And I'm not saying anything about it at all. It doesn't matter. What I'm talking about is the money story for today's currencies that we care about that are affecting our lives, the dollar, the yen, the pound, the euro, all the other. Okay, and the money story starts, begins, the MMT money story with a state that desires to provision itself. The U.S. government wants to provision itself with labor, uh, to uh, provision the military, it needs soldiers, it needs judges in the legal system, it needs uh, people for public education or whatever else it decides it needs. And it also needs uh, goods as well as services, it needs planes for the military, and, uh, uh, pencils for the offices, and air conditioning, and buildings, and things like that. Okay, so it, it needs these things. And how do you, it doesn't, the public sector itself doesn't produce them. It has to obtain them from the private sector. It has to extract them. So how does the government shift real resources from the private sector to public domain? Okay, and it does it uh, through the monetary system. And the first, it can, can it create its own currency and name it and call it the dollar, U.S. dollar? But there's nothing for sale in U.S. dollars. You, can, you know, like uh, Minsky once said, uh, anybody can create a currency. The idea is to get people to 
sell something in exchange for that currency. And so the, num the number one thing you have to do to the state does to provision itself is it levies a tax. It creates tax liabilities. So tax liabilities come first. And the purpose of the tax liability is to create sellers of the goods and services that the government wants to buy. And sellers of services, people who are willing to work for the money, uh, who are looking for paid work that pays US dollars because that's what's needed for payment of taxes. And for this example, when you think of taxes, think of a real estate tax or a head tax. Yes, an income tax will work, but it's a little more complicated. And just to uh, avoid the complication going through this first example, just think of a real estate tax or a head tax. Okay, so kind of an asset tax. So the government levies a tax, and now there's, this creates people in the economy who need the dollars to pay taxes, period. And so they will sell their, they'll offer their services for sale. And they won't find any takers. Nobody will hire them until, uh, because no one has any of the dollars that are needed to pay taxes. They all come from the government. Okay, so what the government does is levies a tax that's payable in its currency that only it can provide. When I say the government, I say government or its agents. The government, they're all, and the commercial banking system is an agent of the government. And I've had, I mean, MMT proponents of all people tell me I'm wrong. Bankings, they're a private enterprise that work on a for-profit basis. They're not agents of the government. Well, sure, they're private for-profit entities, but that doesn't mean you're not an agent of the government. An agent is somebody who works on behalf of somebody else, and it can be done for a fee. We all have real estate agents and ticket agents and all kinds of agents that are private enterprise working for fees, but they're still agents. So and it's just a simple standard de dictionary definition. It's not some you know, concocted definition for the money story. All right, so the, the funds to pay taxes come only from the government or its agents. Period, and that's how it works. If, if anybody else creates the, you know, money that can be used, it's called counterfeit. There's laws against counterfeiting because they don't want anybody to do that at all. It's all supposed to be coming from the government. All right, so the, the tax is levied. Uh, people owe the tax. The money can only come from the government. They're offering their services for sale. They are now defined as unemployed. Unemployed are people looking for paid work, not people looking to volunteer. For American Cancer Society or Heart Association, people looking for paid work, paid, in this case, in dollars. And, uh, and so in the first instance, uh, the government desiring to provision itself levies a tax for the um, specific purpose of creating unemployment, people that they can then hire by spending their otherwise worthless currency which they do, and that's provisions of government. Once they've hired these people then uh, and bought what they want to buy, once they've spent first, uh, funds can then are then available to pay taxes. So the sequence is first comes a tax liability, okay, second comes unemployment, third comes government spending to buy what it wants, uh, and then Fourth comes the actual payment of taxes or the purchase of government securities. All right, and so when MMT proponents lead with the idea that uh, taxes don't fund spending, it's a bit misleading, okay? And they say, look, the government spends first and then collects tax, that's true, but it's not the full truth. Okay, the government can't spend first until after there's a tax liability that's created unemployment, that's created people looking for work, that's created you know, goods and services for sale. All right, and so the government doesn't need tax revenue to get the money to spend. It's not revenue constrained, but it is constrained by what is offered for sale, and that is created by tax liabilities. Okay, and that is one of the things, the understandings that's it's not wrong to say taxes don't fund spending, okay? But if you lead with that, it's misleading. Uh, or you could start with it and lead with it, but then clarify or something. But don't just leave it with that and then get in an argument with somebody about 
you know, why spending does you don't have to have taxes to be able to spend. Well, it's true. You don't you don't need taxes to be able to pay for something, but you, you need somebody willing to sell the silly thing. And that doesn't happen without tax liabilities. You follow me here? Absolutely. Okay, and you've seen the examples yourself, right? And the arguments that go on and on and on. And the MMT proponent is not, if they'd start with the idea that yes, we need tax liabilities. And, uh, you know, and spending is limited by what's for sale and what's for sale is created by tax liabilities plus savings desires, okay? But it's, you don't have any savings desires until after you have the tax liability. So, so the tax liabilities are creating the sellers that are needed to facilitate spending. So it's, so are taxes needed? Well, if you call tax liabilities taxes, which I think most people would, there's a property tax on your house, they'd say, okay, you know, that's a tax. So that tax funds spending. Well, that's a true statement. Not the money you pay, that doesn't fund the spending, but the tax itself funds the spending in a sense that a funding meaning, you know, supplying goods and services for sale in exchange for dollars. So the word funding is, is ambiguous. You know, it's unambiguously ambiguous as far as I'm concerned. Uh, when, you, when that statement is made on its own without some clarification to clear up that ambiguity. And then semantic arguments follow one after another with, and, you know, with both sides kind of walking away, scratching their heads. And uh, okay, so that's one of my, um, you know, how, how I see things, you know, right now with the money story. Uh, the MMT proponents, for the most part, are not starting the money story with the government that needs to provision itself, and it begins with a tax liability, number one. So I'd say put number one first, the tax liability. Number two, uh, that creates uh, people willing to sell goods and services, the services we call unemployment. Three, the government can then uh, purchase those goods and services to provision itself. And then four, taxes can be paid. So that clearly shows that you know, the revenue from taxes is not, is not what is required for spending. So in that sense, tax revenues don't fund, you know, spending or whatever. They're not, they're not part of the theory. Spending comes first and then the taxes are paid. And there's, uh, you can see it in our language, they're called tax returns when you file it because you're returning the money to, the, you know, the dollars to the government. The word revenue means return, I believe in Latin and French. So, uh, where you know it's the return of the funds from the government. You go back to the Bible, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. It's the tax money is being returned to the state. And that's fine. And it's not that return that funds anything because the sequence is the spending comes first, then it's returned. But prior to that, the spending doesn't happen until after the tax liability is in place. So I don't wanna keep going round and round on this. Uh, Enough said. What do you think? Is that something that needs to be addressed? Well, no. I think I think you're doing great. I think you know people will. Um, I, I'm hoping that folks out there that have heard of MMT, have heard various people say it. Maybe they have questions, um, and that we can go ahead and take those questions. Yeah. Uh, from from our audience. So, folks, if you have questions, now's the time. And then. Uh, you know, we'll keep it short because it is late and I want to make sure Warren's not kept up. So uh, we'll have a hard stop at say 10 after 10. Okay. So do we have any, do I, any uh, questions? I have a couple of comments that I wanted to read and then we'll get to some questions. So Joe Jackson, he says, hi, Warren from Australia. And he says he's learned a lot from you. So thank you there. Um, and then Jerry Young, he, he's concerned about the theory part of MMT. He says he's tired of hearing people dismiss it by saying, yeah, well, it's just a theory. Um, and then Virginia is saying, calling the sale of treasury notes debt leads to a whole lot of confusion. So on Virginia's question, can you um, address that? And then I will queue up some more questions for you. Uh, okay, well, I did, the name Modern Monetary Theory came from a reader, I believe, of Bill Mitchell's blog who started using it and it stuck. And 
several of us had some discussions afterwards. What do you think about it? And I said, well, whatever. It's not our name. We don't. It's not. We don't have control over this. This is what people are calling it. And in any case, it seems to be creating interest, and it seems to be uh, helping spread the understanding. So, I agree with you. It's not a theory. It's a, a framework for analysis. Uh, but uh, a, there wasn't much we could do about it, and it's it's now identified us. So. I think we can just use it to our advantage because it opens the door for discussion and then we can talk about how it's actually a framework of, you know, for analysis and not a theory. Uh, second, on the idea of debt. Correct, and then back in soft currency economics, I propose renaming it the interest rate maintenance account because IRMA, IRMA, sounds much more friendly than uh, the public debt, and that type of thing. But look, for an accounting, Point of view, point standpoint. The outstanding dollars that have the dollars spent that haven't been used to pay taxes, whether they're sitting as reserves and reserve accounts or they're sitting in securities accounts, which we call the public debt, uh, are government liabilities. And so, uh, for the accountants to call it, well, they have to call it a liability. It's going to be a liability. It's a public debt because at one point it was convertible into gold, right? So it was actually a debt where they owed you the gold be backing it. And at this point, the only thing they owe you for a $10 bill is two fives. You know, you can get change, but you can't get anything else. And I'd like it if it wasn't that, but um, we're, we're, there's, not, there's not much we can do about it except to um, explain what it is. The dollars that have been spent that haven't yet been used to pay taxes that are just sitting in securities accounts, which are like savings accounts. In the same way, your money in a savings account is the debt of Bank America or Citibank. Uh, the money sitting in a savings account or a checking account of the Federal Reserve Bank is considered a debt of the Federal Reserve Bank. And the fact that banks create their own deposits, and, and so what they owe you is uh, not a not something that's of any. Uh, that they have any kind of like revenue constraint on and B, it's a tax credit. It's a thing to be used for payment of taxes. So they they owe you the ability to, you know, to pay taxes. If you have a dollar on deposit, they owe you the right to uh, extinguish one dollar's worth of taxes with that money. So in that sense, it's, it's a debt. And uh, Again, I'd rather not see it called that because I think it, I agree with you, it is misleading, but we're sort of stuck with it and uh, and I think we can get past it. Um, but uh, you know, but I, I certainly sympathize with that and I've worked against it in the past, but it, it seems best now at this point to me to just leave it alone and explain it for what it is and move on from there. Great. Um, we do have a question from Andy Kennedy. Andy, you are unmuted. Go ahead with your question. Microphone's not in the right spot. Okay. Okay. So my question, Warren, is are you surprised at the length of time that it's taken for MMT to gain traction? And the second part of this question is looking back, is there something, a different strategy that you would have uh, thought might have worked better um, in yeah. getting MMT into the spotlight? I, I think the largest problem has been me because I don't have any celebrity status. So I blame my father by not having the money to send me to a name school. You know, if I'd gone to Stanford or Harvard or London School of Economics, it probably would have gone up a lot more quickly rather than uh, University of Connecticut, which at the time was just a fallback school that $300 a year that you went to if you could get in anywhere else. So, uh, I, you know, look, it's all been done without any uh, celebrity support. It's gone from just me for a while to just me. And then, you know, with a little bit of work, it went from me, and then it was Bill Mitchell, and then it was Randy Ray and Matt Forstatter. And so it went to one to two to four to eight. And if you you know, double it every year for 30 years, you get to a few million, and which is where we are now. And, and so it's come up the hard way without any publicity from anybody with any celebrity status whatsoever. And I think the only thing that could have been done would have been somehow at the beginning to 
you know, get somebody like, uh, I don't know, you know, some Nobel Prize winner or some famous actor, somebody, you know, behind it trying to uh, get it more exposure. So, uh, I don't know. You know, I, you know we, we, I've done what I could and thought about that exact question for a long time. I did not want it to take 30 years. And, uh, but I never could come up with anything. Thank you. Um, Jeffrey, uh, if you wouldn't mind, um, you are unmuted now. Go ahead with your question, please. Uh, yeah. Hi, Warren. Hi. I just want to say that the uh, government liabilities uh, describing the debt really clicked for me. So thank you for uh, describing that. Oh, good. Uh, my question was, uh, what would be the advantage or disadvantage of setting interest rates <clears throat> at zero, excuse me, for all time? Okay, so I look at zero, I look at what, think in terms of what's called the base case for analysis. And so I've been in the facilitator of three currencies, new creator of three new currencies uh, over the last 30 years. First was the Buckaroo at UMKC, and then there was a Denison Dollar with uh, Fidel, and then there was uh, Andrea Terzi at Lugano with the uh, Franklin Frank. And they're all the same. What they did was they wanted uh, the state, which is a school, wanted to provision itself with student labor. They wanted students to do uh, uh, nonprofit work. And so I proposed at UMKC that they do it through the buckaroo, where each student was required to submit 20 buckaroos or whatever per semester, or you don't get your grades. So that was the tax. And you could earn a buckaroo. They call it the buckaroo because it was the mascot was a kangaroo for the university. Uh, by doing work at designated nonprofits, whether it's the hospital or the police department or whatever. And so the students, and you get one buckaroo per hour. And the students would go out and earn a buckaroo, work an hour at the hospital, and then they'd have that, accumulate those until they got their 20 and they could pay their tax to get their grades. And one of the purposes of doing it that way was to educate the students as to how the monetary system worked. And they always had a zero rate policy. The school never paid interest on buckaroos the students had saved. Uh, and, uh, and, th and, that, and that to me is a base case for analysis. Now they could have created a policy of if a student deposited an extra buckaroos with the school, they could have paid them 5% or whatever, but it never made sense to do that. So they never did. And so what I'll say to you is that clean sheet of paper approach, when you start a currency, if you understand what you're doing, you'd never, you'd never pay interest on it. You just leave the excess savings with whoever decided to earn the excess. And I, I remember I did the accounting the first year, it's probably on a video somewhere, the UMKC, and maybe the total tax was 2,000 or 1,000, and maybe the amount the students earned was 1,100. So the government, the school spent more buckaroos than it collected, students earned extra, and they um, saved them for whatever reason, maybe the parents had them for souvenirs and they kept them for the next year, or they just felt like earning extra. You know, you know, just for security, uh, who knows? But there was a deficit, and of course, it didn't affect the university's credit rating when Moody's came to rate its debt or anything like that. Nobody cared. It has nothing to do with your uh, the credit of the institution, whether they were in a deficit or not. It didn't affect their ability to pay students the buckaroo notes. And um, the zero rate policy didn't like create inflation or anything like that. And, and what was pointed out, which is critical understanding for MMT is, is the inflation story. And because the currency is a monopoly, monopolists are price setters, uh, the price level in general terms doesn't change. You know, or it's a function of the terms of exchange set by the school. So the school says a buckaroo is the pay for one hour of student labor that was 25 years ago, that's still the case today. The buckaroo was worth an hour of student labor then and it's worth an hour of student labor today. Now, back then, some students bought buckaroos from other students because they didn't have the time or didn't want to go do the volunteer work. And the other students would go do the work and they would sell the 
buckaroos to the student. And back then, the market for that was $5 per buckaroo, $5 an hour for student labor. Today, I think it's something like $20 or $25 an hour for student labor. So the value of the buckaroo in terms of dollars, the exchange rate, it's gone from you know, $5 to $20, $25. I mean, it's got, the value has gone up more than the S&P 500. But the, the buckaroo itself has been internally stable. It still buys one hour of student labor. What's happened is the U.S. dollar, it used to be $5 to buy an hour of student's time. Now it's 20 or 25, okay? So what we've seen is depreciation of the dollar and not appreciation, so to speak, of the buckaroo, unless you want to argue the relative value of student labor has changed versus other goods and services, which is, you know, not, a, not wrong to say. It probably did some, but I'm sure that's a relatively small part of it. All right. But anyway, that explains how it works. And so, um, so all three currencies now have existed for a long period of time with a zero rate policy, no bonds been sold to mop up savings or any reason. And there's been no inflation uh, and no currency depreciation uh, because of the zero rate policy. Now, what's also happened is we've had the luxury of time to see the same thing in Japan, where they've had a zero rate policy for approximately 30 years, well, over 20 years, with uh, no sign of inflation, no um, currency uh, depreciation. It's, it's appreciated over that time. Uh, and the same thing with the U.S. when we were on our zero rate policy. It didn't cause the hyperinflation everyone was afraid of. And then Europe has gone, and Japan to some degree has gone to negative interest rates. And it's still Switzerland, negative rates, and it still hasn't caused inflation or anything else. It's worked the other way around. And so we can use this model to show what interest payment on the debt actually is. And what it is, is it's what I call basic income for people who already have money. If you start paying, if you go from 0%, which is the base case for our analysis, to you know, 5%, now everybody who already has money saved in treasury bonds gets you know, net payments from the government. And the government's making this net payment to the economy. And not the first day, but over time, if you've got 20 trillion of debt, you start paying 5%, you know, you're paying, um, uh, how much is that? <laughs> you, know, a, you know, a trillion dollars a year of interest to people who already have money. So mm -hmm. it, if you want, and that actually works to make the economy stronger, the government being a net payer of interest is paying this money out. So raising rates Again, I call it basic income for people who already have money, and it tends to add to inflation by adding to demand by uh, increasing the income in the economy by the amount that the interest rate increases. That's the net in income. In that is a, a net income increase for the economy through that interest rate channel. <clears throat> and if you reduce it, the opposite happens. You're taking away money from the economy. So as the U.S. government reduced rates from 5% to zero, it removed something like $400 billion a year of interest income from the economy. And of course, the recovery has been the weakest we've ever had. Uh, and, and so if anything, the Fed has the interest rate thing backwards. High rates pump money into the economy by interest payments and lower rates you know, take that money away from the economy. And negative rates are actually a tax. Now, Elizabeth Warren's out there saying we want a tax on asset tax on money, you know, so you know, $100 and there's a 1% asset tax, you're going to only have $99. And that's supposed to, everybody's screaming, oh, that's going to hurt the economy, the tax is taking away money. Okay, well, a negative 1% interest rate uh, would do the same thing. You start off with $100 in the bank, a year later you have 99 Yet, if the Fed went to a negative rate, everybody was saying that's inflationary, <laughs> you're, you're, you're going to like pump up the economy from that. So the exact same policy, whether you know when it's described as a tax increase, is bad, and when it's described as a you know a negative interest rate, it's good. Well, obviously it can't be both. It's bad. It's a tax. Okay, it's a negative on the economy. It's removing interest income. Am I rambling off of your question, or is there more to it? No, that was that was the I couldn't have asked for a, a better answer. Thank you very much. Okay, sure. Okay, so in the interest of time, we'll take the last question. And this one is from Susan Eldridge. Susan, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, so um, I'm, and I don't know what the 
um, if this is even possible, but what is the best way to, for the presidential candidates, or specifically Bernie, he was asked again today, I think it was today, um, you know, Warren came out with a plan for how she's gonna pay for it. Uh, what is your cost? What is your plan? How could we haven't come up with something else? How much more am I gonna have to pay in taxes? And I think he got, he didn't like the question, and, and I know why he doesn't like the question. And then, you know, he talked about how we're already paying for it. And, and then he said um, at the end, something like, um, we're gonna, I'm gonna probably do like a 4% payroll tax. So your taxes are gonna go up. And, you know, but he talked about how it's gonna be less because you're not gonna pay the cost. I think it's confusing people. And I don't know, I'm just wondering like, what would be the answer? Yeah. that they be giving <laughs> to people and they've, only, and they've only got like five minutes and then a room full of people that aren't economists that don't yeah. un really understand and you know without their heads exploding yeah so what do we do <laughs> yeah so look the right answer which let's just say his staff knows and he can't come to it and what you're hitting on is when uh, i think steve talked about how the problem's been the headline left that hasn't changed Okay, the biggest obstacle to Medicare for all is Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. They're its own worst enemy because of those types of answers that they're giving. It proves to the other side that we can't afford this and we can, you know, we're much better off you know, trying to patch what we have. Okay, so the headline left has shifted from maybe the Robert Reichs and the Paul Krugmans to the Bernie Sanders and the Elizabeth Warren, but it's still the same problem, right? right? So the right answer is, look, we go to Medicare for all and we make it. And the other thing is they want people to pay for it. You know, it's not free. Okay, if we go to Medicare for all by just simply lowering the age of Medicare from 65 to zero, and now it's free for everybody, a couple of things are gonna happen that all economists will agree with and all analysts will agree with. And that is it will have a, uh, prices in the economy are likely to come down because businesses, healthcare expense goes to zero when their costs go down and they're competitive with each other, it puts downward pressure on prices. So that's called a deflationary event. It brings prices down. The other thing it does is puts, I, the last number I saw was 2 million, but it could be as many as 5 million people out of work who are working in private insurance companies doing things that aren't going to be done anymore. Some of their jobs will, Medicare is going to need more people, so some of them will get jobs there. But uh, Nobody's going to be needed in advertising or marketing or anything like that. And uh, all the promotional efforts they do and all the infrastructure of uh, managers and CEOs and the whole thing, that, that's all gone. Okay. And so you're going to see unemployment go up from, I'd say, two to five million, and you're going to see prices coming down. This is the first order effect. Uh, and when that happens, you don't raise taxes or you know, cut spending somewhere else. Okay, if anything, when faced with that kind of an economy, you lower taxes or you increase public services, you do the reverse. So when you have a major deflationary event that throws people out of work, brings prices down, there is no tax increase. That's completely misses a point. That, okay, now, two or three years down the road, spending should pick up because people will have more income because they won't be paying all this money for health care. And at some point, the increase in spending uh, could cause the economy, let's say, to overheat two or three day, years down the road. And should that happen? It may not happen, okay? If, if output increases enough, if productivity increases like we think it will, it might not happen. But should, for any reason, at any time, the economy overheat, then you would either need to uh, cut back, you can, you can let it overheat, it's not the end of the world if inflation goes to four or 5%, or you can cut um, spending or you know, somewhere else or uh, increase taxes to uh, cool things down. Now, here's the thing. If you're driving your car down the road and you know you're gonna need to turn, you know, make a turn in five miles, you don't make the turn now to get it over with because you're gonna crash off the side of the road. You wait till you get to that exit and then you make the turn. Okay, the economy is the same way. If you've got an economy now that's not only not overheating, but contracting because of two to five million new unemployed and the deflationary effect on prices. You don't like raise taxes now because someday there might be an overheating economy. Okay, you just, that doesn't make any sense at all. Okay, well, that's the right answer. Now, is that gonna make people's heads explode? I don't know, but it's the right answer. 
And at least the economic advisors to these people should be doing it. At least somebody, you know, should be saying this. But it, it started off, I was the only one. And then the MMT proponents picked up, picked up on it, looked at some of the numbers, did the hard work, which I didn't do. It, it quantified some of it. And, uh, but they're not in a position to be saying it publicly as an advisor for any of the candidates. So go ahead, I'll turn it over to you here. So first things first, Warren, thank you very much for taking the time to be yeah. with us. Um, really, really appreciate it. I know that you're very, very busy right now. So um, folks, I want to give Warren a virtual round of applause and, and really thank him for all the support he's given us. Um, I believe Warren was the very first person I tried to interview on BeLive the first time I did a face-to-face. Uh, -face. So this is always, you know, seems to be Warren is the first I try to go to for everything. So Warren, thank you very much for taking the time with Steve, us tonight. And uh, let me, Steve, let me add one last thing here. Sure. The, the other um, counterproductive thing that's cropping up now is the term monetary sovereign. Okay, you just don't need it. And again, it causes confusion. If you know, and it, and it's the MMT proponents started using it about oh, 10 or 15 years ago. And I, I didn't like it then. It's not wrong, but it requires a self definition that you can't look up in the dictionary anywhere. It requires a specific definition. And so it, they've come up with like five or 10 different things, you know, that you have to have for monetary okay. sovereignty. And the list is endless and it's like the hydra that keeps growing. And it's just not necessary at all. It's just a state that issues its own currency. Uh, uh, is you know MMT analyze, provides a framework for uh, for analysis for any state with any currency, and if they have external debt, we can show how it works with that. Uh, we can say that if you want to support full employment policy, external debt can be a problem, convertibility can be a problem, but you know it, it can all be done very nicely and very understandably without this introducing a new term that's basically undefinable and it has continuously evolving definition and draws criticism and rightfully so from the mainstream who say things like yeah, well that MMT keeps moving the, changing the goal lines or something like that you know plays whack-a-mole and they're not they're not wrong when they say that so just think about what you're saying and if you can just leave that out and just say what you're actually saying I think it'll be a lot more constructive okay and with that, sir, I appreciate your time, and uh, we will be in touch with you very soon. Thank you, okay. everybody. Thank you, Warren. And uh, I just have a few more closing um, remarks. We were going to do a demo of the new website, uh, but one of the things I wanted to announce before we uh, close off. Um, so, oh, Steve, you know, yes, sir. Uh, the, the white paper was meant to clear these things up. And Put the definitions in and the sequences in. It's fairly short. Maybe you can direct people to that. Absolutely. In fact, we 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 published Warren's um, white paper on Real Progressives recently, and we will certainly put that as a uh, send away, if you will, with the notes and everything from this particular. And use use the link on my website because uh, I edited some of the grammar and a few other things. Absolutely, not a problem at all. Thanks very much. Have a good you night. Got it, man. Thank you very much and have a great night, sir. Yeah. All, right. All right. So um, what I want to do in light of Warren, thank you so much again, um, is I want to introduce um, a couple people to you all so that you know them. Um, things have obviously changed a little bit about around real progressives uh, with people coming, people going. Um, you know, before we used to have a lot of energy, but we didn't have a lot of skill. Now we got a lot of skill, but people that are not as well known to you because they're behind the scenes actually getting things done. And so um, some of these people may be foreign to you, but I want to introduce um, a few of them. Uh, I'm going to start with people I know you already know, and then I'm going to build up to the big one here. Um, as you know, Rose, um, you know, is our national outreach director. She's also our chief financial officer. And um, Rose will be handling a lot of the books. 
She'll be handling um, a lot of the motivation and the rah-rah and getting everybody together, getting them engaged and building good, solid relationships and ultimately helping us build out our chapter uh, plan for, you know, building, you know, chapters throughout the world, really, but definitely around the country. Also, um, I have not defined, we have not defined the actual title yet, but I want you all to know that Andy Kennedy um, is, by all intents and purposes, the media lead. He is the big dog on the media side. And right now, Andy does all the sound engineering, much of the video pro, you know, engineering and processing, um, and leads a lot of the efforts in terms of building out um, the, you know, a lot of the video work you see. A lot of the snazzy stuff would come down to Mindy Donham, who has really taken on uh, producing a lot of the graphics and all the uh, icons that you see and, you know, pretty much all of the graphic work on the professional side in terms of like website and all the different standards. Of course, we've got others like Joe Jackson who would do a lot of our memes, but we, um, we also have Virginia Cotts and Jabari, um, who, Jabari uh, Morris, who serve as our co-editors-in-chief, uh, um, and they work with our writers. We have Nathan Locke, um, who works with our um, newsletter. Um, we also have uh, a whole team of people working on the back end, uploading and supporting our YouTube channel, um, and, and, you know, it, Ultimately, there's so many piece parts here. It's unbelievable. And, and there's a ton of people that are doing work that I'm not going to mention just out of time and the fact that I'm doing this off the top of my head. So the one person that I want to really bring your attention to momentarily, you know, we have Christina, uh, who is, she goes as always in love <laughs> slash uh, the misfit. Christina is our uh, PMO director. And last but not least uh, is uh, my right arm. Um, her name is Carrie Barber. Uh, Carrie comes to us, uh, and she was originally going to be a writer. Um, and it didn't take me very long to realize that she had the executive type of background and skill sets to do the things that we have been talking about for years, but we could not get anybody to freaking do. Um, and so lots and lots of pain and suffering as we would have all these great ideas and people just wouldn't pull through. They wouldn't show up. They wouldn't do whatever. Well, Carrie has shown up every freaking day and works pretty much around the clock. And she has stood up with Brad Sandler, our 501c4 website. She has done so many things. And in the end, I, I needed a chief operating officer. I needed somebody to take the vision and be able to execute it. And so between our PMO and Carrie's uh, leadership um, in the chief operating officer role, um, Carrie is someone who is incredibly vital to this organization. So I wanna read a quick bio of who Carrie is so you understand why I found her to be such an important piece of the uh, leadership team. So Carrie is a business consultant specializing in marketing and change management with over 25 years experience with nonprofits and Fortune 500 companies, board of directors, and C-suite executives. She herself has served in executive roles within the health and technology industries, managing teams across 133 countries and training managers in the servant leadership methodology. Carrie is a published author for master's level business management and diversity textbooks, both a regional and national award winner of the International Business Communicators Quill Awards, and was just one of the 100 business leaders selected for the Leadership Summit in 2015 to work with Obama administration cabinet members and Chief of Staff Valerie Jarrett on business policy. She was the whistleblower who discovered the link between a lack of insurance coverage under ACA and family living within five miles of a fracking well and was instrumental in holding BCBS accountable for misleading marketing practices that led to the federal courts imposing remediation requirements. 
siding with consumers in Illinois in 2014. In 2016, she was a Bernie-endorsed candidate and has since managed candidate campaigns from county to congressional levels from 2016 to 2019. So needless to say, I'm extremely glad that we have Carrie on this team. Um, she has made a lot of vaporware turn into solid deliverables. And, you know, I got to tell you, if you look back for years, I have said the same speech in videos where I've talked about the four pillars and seven knowledge areas and have been unable to execute and close this deal because either people with really, really outsized egos, um, you know, different objectives, different goals, different whatever, different values uh, just didn't pull through. Well, Carrie has. And we have finally been able to incorporate both organizations as a direct result of her hard work. And I want everyone to know that if you hear from Carrie Barber, she's carrying a big stick, but she means well, and she is absolutely uh, the top brass when it comes to making things happen around here. So without further ado, I want to give you Carrie Barber. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, thank you, Steve. I really appreciate that. I'm happy to be here and it was not at all what I expected. Um, like I said, I just started writing um, and then one thing kind of led to another, but it, it's kind of serendipity and you and I have talked about it. You know, one door closes, another door opens. So I was very active in our revolution and working with campaigns and candidates uh, across the United States. Um, so politics and religion are my two big topics. So I actually like to argue. Um, I'm very happy to be here at RP, and I see the the tremendous potential, not just for progressive causes, but what real progressives can be because of the organizational structure and the model. And um, I'm just thrilled to be a part of it. And and looking forward to getting to a point where I'm not quite so disruptive of everybody's stuff as we um, go through all of this change process. But when we get to that efficient state and everything is running in a nice hum, um, I think it's going to be a real happy place for people to come and, and participate. So I'm looking forward to that. Thank you, Carrie. All right, one final thank you to everybody. For all the volunteers that donate even five minutes of time, I really want to thank you all for everything that you've done. Um, and, and for the donors on this call, you know, I, I want to just say this. I, I know she's probably going to blush, but I'm going to say it anyway. Catherine Class, without Catherine, there is no RP. She has literally stood on her head and put her money where her mouth is and then some. And without her financial support and her always upbeat support for everything that I done, I've never, ever, ever had any negative push. This is somebody who has given us so much. And, and I just want to really thank you, Catherine, for, for believing in us for all these years, for being our top donor, hands down. And, and for really allowing us to purchase the equipment that we use, the software services that we use, they're all very expensive. There's nothing we do here that is cheap. I mean, literally all this stuff costs a lot of money and running websites costs a lot of money and being able to have audio equipment that is uh, fit for podcast, fit for video, fit for events, you name it. It all costs a lot of money, and without your support, we would be nowhere. So I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, and I want to thank everyone, all the dollar donors out there. I mean, a dollar is a huge help to us. You know, we have 7,500 YouTube subscribers. Imagine if 7,500 people gave us one dollar. That in and of itself would really, really be a huge boon to us. We have 125,000 followers on Facebook. Imagine if every one of them gave 50 cents. I mean, we would be cooking with, you know, all kinds of renewable energy, right? <laughs> I mean, the bottom line is, is that we really need funding. And for those who have stepped up, even in small ways, and for those like Catherine who have stepped up in large ways, thank you. Thank you so much for all that. And, I, and with that, I guess I'll leave it open for open discussion so that we can 
um, round this thing off and, and close the door. So does anybody have any questions or comments that they would like to say? Um, give me a second. I will try to unmute everybody. Okay. All the mics are in <laughs> Let the craziness start. I think maybe like unmuting cry. everything might not have been the right MO. Okay, that was <laughs> a mis that was a mistake, Carrie. Right. Can we, can we to decide on what we're going to sing now? Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like somebody needs us to sing some nursery rhymes to help someone get back to sleep. <laughs> I know that feeling all too well. Does anybody have any comments or questions? <laughs> I don't know if you can hear me, but I just wanted to thank you so much. I'm so happy to have been able to sit in on this call. It's been fantastic. Who is so this? Who is it's this? Claudine, Claudine Harrington. Brad invited me. Thank you for joining us, Claudine. Thank you really for coming. Absolutely. Thank you. It's been super informative. Good deal. That Claudine is going to uh, actually write something for us um, for a um, presentation or actually a, a conference in Australia. Oh, wonderful. Wow, hey. very good. Yes, Dr. Hale um, is going to be one of the speakers, and I think that Stephanie's going to be there as well, so it should be fantastic. This awesome. is the, Janu the January event, yes? That's yes. right. We're going, we're going global, baby. Australia, Africa, <laughs> you are, yeah. Well, see, my yeah, idea take, was that Ford Motor starts a, a, an airline, and then I think Pavlina has her, has her pilot's license, so she can fly us all down there for the conference. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'm game. So there, just so you know, um, I want to say this for everyone. Model Kaboob, who has been absolutely instrumental to us having you know, huge amounts of interaction, um, has got an event coming up at Denison on November 20th um, that we will be covering. Um, he sent us an email. We need to get on it. I actually have the graphic. It's, I thought we would be doing it, but um, I'm going to go ahead and send this over to you, Mindy, and Carrie, et cetera. Um, but that's something for us to keep an eye on. I want everybody to know that you know all these things, just because we're real progressives, we are a part of a community. Um, we just happen to have our own role to play in this community. And, and let me just be clear. Um, one of the things that Warren Mosler said when he was on here, um, while it may be true, I want to be very crystal clear. Um, you know, there are some divisions that are happening within the MMT community. There are people that are taking MMT into more political realms that are expanding it. And there is some discussion on what they would call post MMT versus what core MMT is and things like that. And these are all distinctions for people that are you know in academics that really want to get into these sorts of things but for our purposes you know we, we're, we're good community people we want to support the movement we want to support the the learning and we want to be we don't want to be adding confusion um, but we also are speaking to a different audience and i want to be real clear here that um you know Anybody can say anything the way that they need to say it to make a point. There's nobody that's got a uh, lock on the one right way of saying these things because everybody has different ears. And when you when I say something that I think just locks it in, I mean, people all say, oh, Steve, I get it. Thank you so much. And then I hear other people go, man, this guy doesn't know his ass from his elbow. What is he talking about? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it really comes down to um, how people listen and how people hear things and what works. And, mm. and if it works, then it was right. I hate to say it like that, but at this point in time, you know, if one of our big drivers is obviously the environment and we've got, you know, 10 and a half years before things hit and, you know, we're not in elected office. So that means we've got to do what we can to impact that. 
and by hook or by crook, I'll do what I have to do to keep this planet around for a little while for my kid to survive in it, you know, and Agreed. I think that's all of our goals is to try and make sure that we leave the planet better than what we received it in. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I want to make sure we understand that, yes, there are some divisions, but there isn't divisions in terms of uh, goals. I mean, there's divisions in terms of, you know, expansion, understanding how things work. And you'll hear Bill Mitchell have his own take. You'll hear Randall Ray have his own take. You'll hear Stephanie have her own take. And you hear Warren have his own take. And then Fado will say things differently, et cetera. And, you know, I, I take the old AA adage, take what you need and leave the rest. At the end of the day, how you say it, how you clear your message, how you communicate to people that are peers, it's more important that they understand that you care. It's more important that you're able to say it in a way that they hear you. And it's more important that you're able to change minds than being perfect. That's, that's my take. And, uh, Hopefully that gives you a little bit of slack to not feel like you got to be perfect. The goal here is to communicate at the end of the day that yes, we can indeed have nice things. And, uh, you know, we can in fact take care of one another. I think that's, that's the big non-economic jargon takeaway is that we can in fact take care of the things we need to take care of. All right. That's wonderful. That helps a lot with what I have to write uh, for January's conference because I'm not an economist. It's Claudine again, and I'm not, I'm definitely no expert in the area of the economy. So what you just said there really speaks to me. I really appreciate that. Got it. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I just figured out that Denison University is an, only an eight hour drive for me, so I'm going. <laughs> Okay. Um, I, you know, I would like to welcome everybody and also thank everyone for joining. I know that we have a, a recent Dr. Hebby that just joined us. We're excited to have him from India. I'm very, very happy to have him join. Um, folks, I really hope you take some time and think about this. We can't do the big things we want to do if we don't have people willing to miss the ball game and join a conference call and help us work. Um, all of us are working, right? This is, this is no easy task. We're not going to see the change we want to see by just cheering on some random candidate, even if it's as good as Bernie. Look at how many of Bernie Sanders supporters still think silly right-wing economic lies. I mean, no joke. I get more pushback from people that I would consider my, my own than I do from people that we would denigrate in a New York minute, New York second. And, you know, the good guys sometimes, unfortunately, here within our own movement are absolutely more ill-informed than a Trump supporter. Mm. And that is something that we have to come to grips with in order to change it. Um, you know, it's, it's fine to have unity, but if they're uniting around something that's going to lead us off a cliff, as real progressives, it's our job to be true north and to bring them back on course. And um, so I'm hoping that you all will roll up your sleeves, raise your hand really, really high, and let us know that you're willing to help us because we need help. We need, we need people sharing our podcast, folks. This podcast is really important to our, our future, and we really need people helping us share it. And uh, anyway, that's all I have. Does anybody else have anything before we go? Is this going on YouTube? Uh, we hope so. <laughs> Who is this, by the way? Tommy LeBeau, Dan's son. Oh, okay. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Got it, man. You got it, everybody. Thank you all Thank very you. much. And uh, with that, I guess we'll call it a night. Thank you all, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, brother. Thank you, Steve. Bye. Thank you, Steve. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks, everyone. This is a great. This is a great call. Yeah, it was. Yeah, was good. Definitely. Let's do it again. You got Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Excellent. All right. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night, good night all.